us begin. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. You see, the home of God is among mortals, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will, need more, will be no more, for the first things have passed away. Friends, the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want, and there is nothing in all of God's creation that can ever separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus, our Lord. These are the promises of God. Friends, in what we call the writings of the Hebrew Scriptures, they remind us there that for everything, Ecclesiastes reminds us that for everything there is a season, a time for everything under the sun. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to rejoice, and a time to, to remember. We are gathered here today to remember and to celebrate the life of Daniel Robert Graham, Bob Graham. We come with a deep sense of personal loss for, for one who has lived such a noble and distinguished life among us has died. And when death comes to those whom we love, there's a certain dying in us as well. And so there is a certain sadness from within. Friends, both our life and our death belong to God. Both our life and our death are sacred. And the same God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, gives life in the midst of death. Friends, let's stand and sing America the Beautiful. It's in the bulletin, in the program. and know most of the Grahams pretty well. <clears throat> At this time, I'd like to invite the current pastor of the church, Reverend Dr. Daniel Medina, to offer words of welcome. Reverend Medina. First Lady Adele Graham, distinguished children of the Graham family, welcome to a place of green pastures and still waters which your generosity and vision laid the foundation of this parish. Our deepest condolences. To all distinguished guests and public servants in our community, in our state, and in our nation, 
Welcome to your home of the people and by the people of God. And to all guests, visitors, family and friends and colleagues, and to the members of Miami Lakes Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, welcome home. On behalf of the parish and the school, I welcome all of you with a heavy heart, with rejoicing for a distinguished life of service. And because of that, you can call a servant home. My name is the Reverend Dr. Daniel Medina. It is my honor to be the pastor of this parish since February of 2021. As a senior in the Honorable Bob Graham's alma mater, Miami High, Stingery, I canvassed for the Honorable Bob Graham. And I have to say that throughout the campaign and at the victory party, the love, the hospitality, and the singular vision of this wonderful man made a huge and incomparable impact in my life. And I thank each and every one of you for bringing that same spirit to this, your home, on this special and sacred occasion. We welcome all of you, and God bless you all. Thank you, Dr. Medina. I want to, want to share some scripture readings with us at this time, some of Bob Graham's favorite scriptures, starting with Proverbs 29, just one verse, verse 18, where there is no prophecy, the people cast off restraint, but happy are those who keep the law. And then from Matthew's Gospel, two verses, the greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. You can see the theme of humility running through these scriptures. And then from Philippians, the second chapter, known as the Christ hymn, it's about the self-emptying love of Jesus. These words, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And I want to share one last reading here from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, portions from 1 Corinthians 13, his famous love chapter where we read that love is patient and love is kind. Love isn't jealous or boastful. Love isn't arrogant or rude. Love doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. Love doesn't rejoice with what is evil, but rather love rejoices with what is good. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. And in the end, there are these three things that last. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Let us pray. Most high and creator God, on this special day, we give you thanks always for the timeless gift of life. And today, especially, we thank you for the life of Bob Graham. Our thoughts and our feelings run deep, O oh God. He was such a wonderful man. We thank you for the special times we shared with him as family and friends, times around special occasions, birthdays, anniversaries, baptisms, weddings, special times around Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, special times, too, at work or in the community. We thank you for his timeless gifts of public service on so many levels, in the Florida State Legislature, as governor, 
on the national level in the United States Senate, and then with the Graham Center for Public Service at the University of Florida. We pray your dedication upon his life this day. We thank you for his leadership, his vision, his courage. We pray for the family during the season of deep personal loss. We pray for Adele. Surround her with your love as it shines in and through us. Lift her spirit with a blessing of so many memories. Bring her healing through the sadness of these days. Let your love sustain her with the warmth of your saving grace. And we pray for the granddaughters and their families that they will all, as they are able, continue to remember and to celebrate with pride in their spirits the life of their father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. Again, so many memories, so much to honor and to celebrate. In the weeks, months, and years ahead, things will happen in our lives when we will remember Bob Graham. Perhaps it's a discussion around the dinner table or a good win for the Florida Gators, maybe a walk on the beach, a family gathering, some lofty achievement perhaps on the state or national stage. Stuff will happen that will evoke memories of Bob Graham, and we will remember. And our remembering will bring a glow to our spirit that we have been blessed to have been a part of Bob Graham's life. Elevate him always, O oh God, into your divine presence. Amen. And now, how great thou art, Mr. Ed Sig.
Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. Thank you very much, Ed. Well done. Thank you. It's time now, friends, for the words of tribute and remembrance. Daniel Robert Graham, Bob Graham, was born on November 9th, 1936, in Coral Gables. At least that's what Wikipedia says. <laughs> Coral Gables, is that correct? Is that where he was born? I'm hoping I've got that right. He was the son of Ernest Cap Graham and Hilda Graham. He was the half-brother of Mary... Phil, and Bill Graham. At Miami High School, where his three siblings had attended, Bob was senior class president, and the Miami Herald named him best all-around teenage boy. <laughs> that never happened to me. <laughs> Early on, he developed an interest in politics and public service. At the age of 30, he was elected to the House of Representatives in the state of Florida followed soon by election to the state senate. Then in, 1970, then in 1978, young and virtually unknown, he ran for governor. Many thought it was kind of out of the blue. Where did this come from? But through hard work and creative strategy empowered a lot by the success of his work days, he was elected Florida's 38th governor. After serving two terms, he went on to serve three terms, 18 years, in the United States Senate. I got to know Bob and Adele in 2000 when I became pastor of this church where Bob and Adele were charter members. And I soon learned that when they were in town, they came to church. They were church people. What an idea. <laughs> At this time, we're going to ask five of you, your names are in the, the program, to come up at this time and offer some words of tribute and remembrance to Bob Graham. Sarah, you're first. You can do it. Hi, everyone. Uh, before I begin, uh, I would like to recognize the youngest attendee here, Isabella Renzi. Did she step out? She's my grandfather's uh, uh, oldest grand, uh, great-grandchild, so at the center back here. <laughs> As the, uh, as the oldest granddaughter, I'm proud to pass the baton to, uh, to Isabella. I'd like to start with an origin story. You all are here because you knew Bob Graham. You were his friends, his colleagues, his family. My grandfather had many titles, governor, senator, but most importantly, he was our doodle. Our grandparents were never grandma or grandfather. They were always Deedle and Doodle. My beautiful grandmother is Adele Graham. The story goes that I was attempting to repeat Adele, and the best I could come up with was Deedle. So our grandmother has always been Deedle, and then naturally, the only name that goes with Deedle was Doodle. <laughs> so today, many will remember Bob Graham but his grandchildren will always remember our doodle. Since my grandfather's passing, I've read a lot of the wonderful and kind and generous things that people have said about doodle. It has been overwhelming and at times 
hard to process the immense impact he had on so many in Florida and across the country. In addition to the outpouring of memories, the past few weeks have surfaced an archive of photos, videos, and speeches. The unstated benefit of a public life is that it is recorded for posterity. My favorite thing to read was Doodle's farewell address to the Senate. In December 2004, I was 14 years old. I remember running around the Capitol, laying on the floor of the rotunda, and watching Doodle sign his Senate desk. But today, at 33, I'm glad to be reminded of how my grandfather reflected on his own life and public service. He said, I was born to a family with good values, an admiration for education, and an interest in politics. Because we are the grandchildren of Bob and Adele Graham, this is our history and legacy as well. We were born to a family with good values and an interest in politics. We all watched my grandfather navigate the world based on those values and that interest. My grandfather listened. He took notes. We waited. <laughs> Sometimes we waited for a very long time. <laughs> if there is anything I will take from my time with Doodle, it is the importance of listening to and understanding others. But the enduring personal legacy of my grandfather is in his family and the care and love he and our Doodle showed us. We had the opportunity to celebrate Doodle's life as a family a few weeks ago. My grandmother encouraged each of her grandchildren to share their own memories of our grandfather. The universal theme was how our grandparents celebrated and were present for each of us individually and as a family. Doodle and Deedle attended my fifth grade graduation my graduation from Leon High School, and my graduation from college. My brother Mark shared how he and Doodle had enjoyed dinners at the University of Florida, and of course, always into the night with the Go Gators. <laughs> my cousin Melissa remembered how Doodle attended her dance recitals and told stories together about Rhoda the alligator. Kendall shared memories in the pastures at Graham Angus Farm and a doodle-like reminder to just listen. Adele remembered our grandfather showing up to her third grade classroom in Great Falls, Virginia to simply sit with her friends and classmates. Peyton described shared aspirations, private advice, and his always attentive ear. Caroline beautifully noted how her passion for public education and service came directly from doodle. My brother Graham reminisced over meals at my grandfather's favorite restaurant, Sonny's Barbecue. <laughs> and the effort my grandparents took to see and spend time with their grandchildren across the country. Doodle attended countless basketball games here in Miami Lakes as our youngest cousin, Lewis Robert, grew up in this community. And Ansley remembered his being, his presence, and his scrunched nose when he came in for a kiss. <laughs> but my cousin William perhaps said it all most simply, that Doodle was his best friend. And that if that was all he had done in his life, it would have been enough. Through our family, Deedle and Doodle have given us a lifetime of friendship and support and love. In those same farewell remarks to the Senate, Doodle began by saying that the greatest influence of his life had, of course, been his family. I am sure it is no understatement that for all of us, luckily, to be his family, and indeed for so many of us gathered here as chosen family, he was our greatest influence. Doodle started each call and note to me and to all of his grandchildren. Sarah, this is your loving grandfather. I am so grateful that he was.
Well done, Sarah. Doodle would have been very proud of you. It's time now for Gwen Graham to come up. Gwen, you want Suzanne to go next? Suzanne, come on up, my dear. Don't leave those glasses away. And I put my eulogy um, in my dad's speech box that I found in Tallahassee as we were clearing out. Governor D. Robert Graham, good luck. <laughs> Hello, my name is Arva Suzanne Graham Gibson and I'm daughter number three. Oops. Thank you for joining us today or watching via live stream to honor our father. Once upon a time, there was a rural and rustic farm on the edge of the Everglades, which we tried to emulate today with the flowers, <laughs> not far from where we sit today. Living at Pensuco Farm, later called Graham Dairy, was Dad's father, Ernest Graham, also known as Cap, his wife, Florence, who passed away at an early age, and their three children, Mary, Bill, and Bill. What followed were a series of serendipitous but deeply fortunate events, all happening in my dad's beloved Florida. After Florence passed, Cap Graham met his future bride, Hilda Simmons, a school teacher, on the Pensacola and Atlanta Railroad passenger train. Hilda boarded at her hometown of Defuniac Springs, and Cap boarded in Tallahassee, heading to Jacksonville to connect to take another train back to Miami. Hilda clearly caught Cap's eye, and after a brief courtship, they married, with Hilda joining Cap in what could only be described as the southern frontier on the edge of the Everglades. The plan was they were not going to have any more children. However, happily for all of us, in November of 1936, a honeymoon baby, Daniel Robert Graham, was born. More, more chance encounters ensued in the creation of the Graham family lore. My mom's parents met in the early 1930s on the steps of the historic courthouse in downtown Miami. My grandfather's name was Gabriel Corey, who immigrated from Beirut, Lebanon, and worked at the Prudential Insurance Company. My grandmother was Mildred Moore from Ridgeville, Ohio, working as a legal secretary for Judge Jefferson B. Brown, at that time a circuit judge from, for Dade and Monroe counties. Now, like my dad and my namesake Arva, if you know me, you know I cannot resist the opportunity to share a Florida historical fact. <laughs> Mildred's boss, Judge Brown, was previously Chief Justice of the Florida Supreme Court in 1917 and also the chair of the Florida Railroad Commission, where he brokered the deal with Henry Flagler to extend the railroad to his hometown of Key West. And the court complex in Key West is named after Judge Brown. As the story goes, Gabriel first saw Mildred gliding down the long, beautiful stairs at the historic courthouse, courthouse wearing a red cape that she had sewn for herself. Gabe pursued Mildred for six years, they married in 1934, and happily for all of us, had a child, Adele Corey, who was and remains completely adored. Now fast forward to Gainesville, 1957, and another chance meeting. Adele Corey was walking out of the administration's building at the University of Florida, go Gators, <laughs> where she was seeking a tutor for a science class. Bob recognized the elegant and beautiful Adele from Miami, approached her and said, Adele, you don't need to hire a tutor. I'll be your tutor. <laughs> and the rest, as they say, is history. Mom, we all want to thank you for needing that tutor at the University of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> that happy encounter led to 65 years of love and devotion to each other family, state, and country. And if I dare say, the most iconic and gracious First Lady of Florida has ever known. Let's clap it out.
your high touch with thousands of your beautifully handwritten notes as evidence, together with your dedication and advocacy for our father throughout, including his health-challenged years, is a true reflection of your magical life together. Like you, or excuse me, like dad, you are an incredible role model. Two weeks ago, lying in the state of Florida in the old capital, Dad received a richly deserved honor. From start to finish, it was majestic and historic, something I don't think anyone who was in attendance will ever forget. In accompanying my mom back to Gainesville, we discovered from our police escort, Captain Ryan Matina, that all of the branches of the police and military were actually vying to be a part of paying their respects to Bob Graham. Captain Matina told us that while Dad was on his final ride back to Tallahassee after he passed in a motorcade, it was fit for a president. Troopers had assembled at every county line along the route, stand at attention, and saluted as the motorcade passed. And in lives defined by chance encounters, or if you prefer, destiny. I had a magical experience that very next day. True story. At their Oak Hammocks residence in Gainesville, I was walking a wooden trail inside the gates, just trying to clear my head. I sensed a presence just feet away from me, and I realized it was a bobcat. I've checked. No one has ever seen a bobcat anywhere near this trail. Now, for those who don't know, the mascot at the Miami Lakes School, named after my dad, the Bob Graham Education Center, is the bobcat. I, I stopped in my tracks, but I, I wasn't scared. Quite the opposite. A happy calm came over me as I just knew it was dad. The first thought that came to me was that dad was saying thank you. Not just to me, but to all his family, his friends, and all Floridians for a life so very well lived. Our family wants to recognize and deeply thank everyone for the outpouring of support that has allowed our spirits to soar. Personally, I just can't help think, and in very important ways, the real Florida, the real Florida has shown up over these past few weeks. I know I speak for Gwen, Sissy, and Kendall and saying we have never been more proud to be of our Florida heritage, our Miami heritage, to be from Miami Lakes and a part of the Graham family, and most of all, to be Bob and Adele Graham's daughters. I hope that following this service, you will join us at the hotel on Main Street, where we look forward to many of you reuniting from governor, senator days, and hey, even if you're a good old Miami Laker, we want it to be a happy reunion for you all. And my mom wants to remind you that the University of Florida, through its oral history project, will be at the reception preparing, prepared to record your memories and stories about dad. Speaking of the Bob Graham Alumni Staff Network, which is huge, dad's staff used to laugh about having to reserve five tickets from DC to Miami at every time dad needed to come home. Why? Because not only did my dad refuse to not miss a Senate vote, but as we all know, dad would be walking along the way to the gate, see someone and say, hello, what is your name? <laughs> Followed by a battery of questions. And then, as we all know, he would pull out his notepad and write down their information and then ask them to repeat, <laughs> double checking to ensure that he had their name and address correct. And of course, days later, they would receive a follow-up letter, some of which have been framed and shared with us over the past weeks. One of my favorite Maya Angelou quotes is, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. This is utterly true of Bob Graham. And our family has heard so many wonderful stories recently of dad's interaction and impact on others' lives. 
I promise you our family will never tire of hearing your stories. In closing, I recently read a story about dad bringing differing parties to the table in the name of Everglades restoration. Friends of Everglades founder Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was always pushing Bob Graham to do better. And dad respected her for that. Dad said of her, and I quote, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas deals in very tangible action, sorry, deals in very tangible action, whether environmental, scientific, or political. But she also understands that there has to be a sense of magic, that people have to be inspired by what is bigger than themselves, longer than their lifetime. This, I believe, is the essence of Bob Graham, a role model for his descendants, the state of Florida, and our country. You can't go anywhere in Florida without finding something that dad impacted or preserved for generations to come. Someone wrote in the comments section of the New York Times, the sun feels a bit less bright now that Bob Graham has passed. I refuse to believe that that is true. If we live and lead like Bob Graham, the Florida sunshine will glow brighter than ever. I, my hope is that we all have caught some of his light, like how dad and our beloved Uncle Bill would catch fireflies as kids on the edge of the Everglades, or how famed Florida artist Beanie Backus taught the highwaymen how to capture that magical light when painting the clouds floating over the iconic Florida landscapes. When you're lucky enough to catch one of these striking sunsets with the sky full with almost impossible colors, I hope you might think that's our Bob Graham looking over our state and all of its people. Please remember dad in those moments, but most importantly, please remember how Bob made you feel. You will be missed dad I hope you're enjoying magical sunrises and majestic sunsets up there, singing your favorite tunes with Jimmy Buffett. You've earned that. We love you. Thank you. everyone. Got the tissues handy here. <laughs> I have thought a lot about this moment and wondered how I would feel and frankly how I would get through it. And now here I am standing before a wonderful group of people who are all here because you love and respect Governor, Senator, Statesman, and author, very, he was very proud of being an author, <laughs> Bob Graham, also known as husband to Adele and dad to Sissy, Suzanne, Kendall, and myself. I thought, how could I put into words what dad meant to my sisters and me? I'm gonna try my best. It's not easy, but here I go. Dad will always be the best. Many of you have heard me say that many times. We love him so much and we will miss him more than I can say. Since his passing, my mom, sisters, and I have been so touched by the outpouring of love that y'all have shown him. Thank you for loving our dad so much and for loving us, his family, so well through these difficult last weeks. So you all know that dad was an incredible human, so kind, so empathetic, so unbelievably smart, <laughs> always thinking about how he could make complicated matters better, like education, 
the environment, the economy, the lives of all Floridians and Americans. And his interest was not just in the short term, but five, 10, and infinite years into the future. And boy, was he stubborn. <laughs> when he wanted to get something done, he would never give up. For those of you who have worked with him, and I know many of you are here today, and thank you, you know all of this too well. But what I want to share with you today are a few moments of dad as dad. We grew up on Aberdeen Way, not too far from where we sit today. So many, many memories flooded me when I took my walk this morning and stopped in front of my childhood home. Our bedroom surrounded an open courtyard, which was unique and magical. The magic was particularly special on Christmas Eve. That's when mom put dad to work. <laughs> we were all tucked into our bed, supposedly, but we were all listening. <laughs> and I could hear her directing him. <laughs> and I could hear him huffing and puffing. And yes, even occasional swear word. <laughs> As he tried to put together a bicycle or a dollhouse or other gifts for his four girls. As smart as he was, he did not have the best success. Eventually, Dad figured out a long-term plan to solve this problem in his life as well. And he found someone to help him on Christmas Eve that had bike and dollhouse construction skills. <laughs> Another memory are the drives between Miami and Tallahassee for the legislative sessions each spring. Mom would fly. <laughs> Dad would load us into the station wagon with that lovely wood siding. Y'all remember the lovely wood sided station wagons to start the eight hour drive north. This was long before car seats. So Sissy, Suzanne, Kendall and I are rolling around in the back seat we all knew that there would be numerous stops and detours. Dad always had an eagle's eye out for historical markers. He would pull over, unload us, line us up, I was always the tallest, and then carefully read the marker. And then we would be quizzed <laughs> for the rest of the drive north. With dad, we always had a front row seat to Florida history. Every time I see a historic marker, I think of my dad. And that just feels right. When dad was the first elected to the United States Senate, Kendall was finishing up high school. Therefore, mom delayed her move to Washington, DC. So dad and I lived together for a few years. <laughs> he was a great roommate. One night I came home, I found him in the kitchen and he was stirring something that looked inedible in a pot. I asked him, I said, dad, what are you cooking? And he replied proudly, pumpkin. I spotted the empty can and offered to get him something more substantive and tasty for dinner. But he said, no, nope. no Gwen. This is great. That sums up dad. So easy going. The pumpkin met his needs. Plus, it did not cost him a penny. <laughs> dad was notoriously frugal. I want to thank each of you again for being here today and for those who are watching on live stream. And I want to conclude with this last story. 21 years ago, dad ran for president. I think we can all agree he would have been a great president. <laughs> Dad's team asked me if I would be a surrogate for him at the Democratic Convention in Madison, Wisconsin. 
When the time came, I talked about all he had done in Florida, all he had done in the U.S. Senate. I talked about why he would be a great president. And then I said, I am 40 years old, and there has never been a day I haven't been proud to be Bob Graham's daughter. I could visibly see the impact that statement had on the crowd of Wisconsinites, many of whom were learning about Bob Graham for the very first time. After I concluded, so many moms and dads came up to me and said with tears and smiles that they hoped their children would say the same thing about them in the future. It was just me sharing my heart and speaking the truth. Today, I am again sharing my heart and speaking the truth. I am now 61 years old, and there never has been a day that I haven't been proud to be Bob Graham's daughter, and there never will be. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Robin, I think we're going to ask you to come up next, if you can, sir. Beloved friend of Senator Bob Graham. everybody. Bob Graham and I were born a day apart. And uh, he used to enjoy a story about the stork flight and dropping package off here and a package off there. And uh, since I was a day older, I contended every now and then that I was a day wiser, but I could never sell it. <laughs> we grew up in Miami. We were, we came to know each other as presidents of the student body of rival high schools. Miami High, Miami Edison. <clears throat> and, uh, it was a big deal. On Thanksgiving night, 40,000 people were in the Orange Bowl to see that Thanksgiving classic. We went on to the University of Florida. Bob was in the dorm floor above me. We pledged the same fraternity. Pledges in a fraternity are there to do the work of the fraternity without costing it any money. <laughs> so it came time uh, <clears throat> for a Christmas tree for the lobby, for the living room of the fraternity house. And we were given the assignment to get a Christmas tree. So we had a choice. We could go out in the woods and get a scraggly pine tree, but I spotted a picture-perfect Christmas tree. The problem was that it was in somebody's front yard. <laughs> and that front yard faced 13th Street, which was the main north-south drag. And on the other side of 13th Street was the University of Florida. I showed him the tree, 
But because of the traffic, it was perfectly obvious that this was going to have to be done in the dead of night. <laughs> and so, about 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., with our saws in hand, we slithered under that tree. And it had a trunk like I had never seen before. It wasn't a unified trunk. It had shoots, different shoots going up. And there was a fear that maybe if we cut this thing, it would fall into parts. At least that's what I was thinking. We, we weren't saying much. <laughs> and then I think it dawned on both of us at the same time where we were and what we were doing. We were on our stomachs under this tree facing 13th Street within sight of the University of Florida Administration Building where the office of the president was. And it came upon both of us about at the same time. This was not a good idea. <laughs> and <clears throat> we figured we'd better get the heck out of there, which we did. And the next day, we got a scraggly pine tree from the woods without any particular approval from anybody in the in the fraternity. That was the first year. The second year, Adele Curry came from Miami Edison uh, up to the University of Florida and uh, Bob started dating Adele. And that worked out very well as, as we know. The uh, Third year, the, uh, a beautiful girl from St. Petersburg, valedictorian of her class, came up and pledged the sorority that Adele was in. Adele, being the incurable matchmaker, felt that we were perfect for each other. She had always been looking out for me anyway. We had known each other. We went to the same elementary school, Miami Shores Elementary. And she thought it would be a great match. 65 years later, we can tell you she was absolutely right. The fourth year, Bob and Adele were married. And Jean, who I was dating now, came down from St. Petersburg for the wedding. And we attended the wedding and the reception at the Miami Shores Country Club. Two years later, I asked her to marry me. We were in law school at the time, both of us, different law schools. We came back and then we studied for the bar together. Part of that time, we went to the Graham Dairy pasture land and on that pasture land, right about over there, quite a bit away, uh, about a mile probably, on that pasture land was a tent. And in that tent, Cap Graham, Bob's dad, and his two brothers, they announced that they were going to build a place called Miami Lakes. And they did. At this point, our careers diverged some because Bob was uh, started out with family business and then went into public service, and I went into the law practice, and Gene and I moved to 
Lake Wales, but on those trips back and forth, some of the stops were in Lake Wales, and we kept up with each other as we each have four children, children kept arriving. And on one of those trips, Bob wanted to talk to me and he said, I'm going to run for governor and I'd like you to help me. Well, I knew he was not well known outside of South Florida. And so uh, I figured we'd go down in flames together. <laughs> well, we'd done a lot of other things together. And uh, so I said, sure. And then he was sworn in two years later as governor. He never said a word to me, but not until the morning after it was official, he came and he said, I'd like you to be my general counsel. I didn't even know what a general counsel was. <laughs> I was so looking forward to going back and spending 100% of my time on a law practice. And um, talked with the family and I said, okay, I'll give you six months. He said, all right, didn't blink. And so we went through a very eventful six months. We had to call out the National Guard for the trucker strike. We had a, the country's first execution. We had suspending constitutional officers. We had been through, we'd been to federal court. Uh, we'd been through a lot. And when the end of the six months came, he felt like he'd better get somebody a lot like us, a contemporary who was uh, at, in peak of practice. And so John Arell was the next, and he said, well, I like Gibson's deal. Uh, I'll give you six months. And that kept repeating itself. And what we did was, we formed a collection of outstanding young lawyers with wonderful legal ability and political savvy all over the state, which was of great help to us in a number of other things. And after he went on to Washington to be U.S. Senator, You've already heard some, and I'm sure you've read plenty, about all his achievements. And we don't have time for the recitation of those in local, state, federal, even remarkably in the foreign policy area with all of the things that he did. And Buddy will tell you about several of them. But I want to leave you with just two items. One, in the room where it happens. Two, the legacy. When he asked me to be his general counsel, I thought, well, that'll be interesting. Um, I know that there will be some decisions that have to be made, and I, would, I might be a part of them. And I would be, as they say, in the room where it happens. And I was. And we had a lot, particularly that first, when everybody's testing out the new governor, we had a lot of decisions that we had to contend with. 
But the thing I want to get across here, and the thing that I want emphatically to emphasize is, and to any historians that might be the future, what it was like to be in the room where it happens. There was no macho profanity. There was no um, agenda. There was no pettiness. There was no gossip. It was how do we get to make the best decision for the best reason. It was that simple. Now, I want to make one point. You have all had some, you, Bob Graham has been in your company, or you wouldn't be here. Bob Graham was the same person in the room where it happens that he was outside the room where it happens. And since you knew Bob Graham and you have been exposed to him in his company, you have been in the room where it happens because it was no different. The legacy. There are a number of Florida figures in uh, history, politics. Some of them uh, are a, a wide range. Some have been absolutely excellent. A few have been comical. It's a wide range. The achievements that Bob made are just too much to even think about. And it never occurred to me as we were on our stomachs under that tree <laughs> that there would ever come to be a day like this. He clearly belongs in the top echelon of public figures in Florida history. And I think everybody would agree with that. But I'm going to go one step further. And this is just me. I think in that top echelon, there's a group that you might call statesmen. Statesmen with the skills and the respect that cross all boundaries. I think you will find Bob Graham in that group of statesmen. And I want to state a preference in that very small group. I think there's one that's at the top. And I think he is at the top, that one. Because in good measure, he had the opportunity, not only at a state, local, federal, but also in foreign policy. And he distinguished himself all the way along. So I think the top person in that exclusive group is Bob Graham. And he loved 
his state of Florida. And we are all the better for it. came a long way from under that tree, huh? <laughs> buddy Shorstein. Go get him, buddy. <laughs> the, Graham, the Graham family has bestowed upon me the highest of honors by allowing me to share some thoughts with you about a friend I loved, Bob Graham. First, a word about the Graham family. Four highly accomplished daughters who with their spouses have given Bob and Adele wonderful grandchildren and now great-grandchildren. Working with Bob De Graham was never a nine to five job. He worked more nights than he didn't. That the immediate family became outstanding is a credit to Del Graham's guidance and consistent inspiration. <laughs> Adele was a credit to the state of Florida as our first lady. Through 65 years of marriage, Adele was Bob's clear thinking advisor, and she gave me plenty of advice as well. Watching Bob Graham's deterioration over these last three and a half years was painful. But watching the unconditional love that the family shared with Bob was uplifting. We, were un we met as undergraduates at the University of Florida and continued our friendship while Bob was a first year law student at Harvard. I was a junior naval officer stationed on a ship homeport in Boston. Bob was a serious sports fan. In 1960, Boston was a great city for sports. We were able to enjoy Ted Williams' last year as the Boston Red Sox. We frequently saw the Boston Celtics with seven future members of the Basketball Hall of Fame, a team that won nine titles in 10 years and became the most successful dynasty in the history of professional sports. We stayed in touch over the ensuing years, and during his first term as governor, I regulated Florida's professionals for 15 months. During the second term, I was his chief of staff his last 14 months. Bob was my friend, tutor, teacher, and motivator. The most important consistent lesson he taught was good public policy makes good politics. From college days, Bob's intellect was significantly beyond most of his peers. He was scary smart. <laughs> Reminiscing recently with one of our former special counsels, we laughed about the experience briefing Bob. When we entered his office, we were sure we had mastered the subject and ready for any contingency. Invariably, 10 minutes into the briefing, Bob would ask an intelligent question in an area we haven't even thought about and we're totally incapable of answering. <laughs> Prior to his initial campaign for governor, Bob unintentionally, at times, spoke over our heads. Work days changed all that. Yes, the original plan for Bob was to complete 100 work days during the campaign for governor. He would do a full eight hour work day we would call no attention to the workday, figuring that at some point during the campaign, the press would recognize his efforts. Once the media recognized that Bob took workday seriously, the press started reporting the workdays, and the campaign was the beneficiary of free newspaper and tele television coverage. The workday benefit to Bob went way beyond free press. One. He significantly improved his ability to communicate with the people who would elect him, 
And two, he learned with the average Floridian went through to make a living. Although he didn't have to, he continued his work days monthly. All the time he was elected office, he took looked so forward to getting away from me, his staff, constituents, and colleagues, and just spending a day with normal Floridians. He returned to the office after a work day, refreshed and rejuvenated. Bob was never without his spiral notebooks. His father used a similar pad in his management of the family farm. Bob carefully made notes as a reminder of tasks to complete assignments to staff, discussion with colleagues and constituents, reminder to correspond with certain constituents and supporters. Notebooks was his management tool and memory reinforcement. He was a great manager and his memory was superb. One always pleasant, one always pleasant experience was returning to Tallahassee from Washington with Bob. We would encounter former governor staff members and after greeting ple the pleasantries, Bob would ask for a status report about the project that staffer was last working on when he was in the uh, governor's office. <laughs> Once you were a staffer for Bob Graham, you were his employee for life. <laughs> During the 1980s and, and early 1990s, Florida newspapers had some of the best political reporters in the country. Bob enjoyed the give and take discussion with these reporters. They came to trust and like him. Notwithstanding, reporters are trained to be skeptics. A few felt like they had to find something to criticize Bob about. Some characterized Bob's use of the notebooks as quirky. In 1988 Dukakis, 1992 Clinton, and 2000 Gore either vetted or considered Bob Graham as a candidate for the vice presidency. One would wonder whether some reporters characterizing Bob's use of, use of the notebooks as quirky discouraged the candidates for president for, for, from selecting Bob. Had Gore selected Bob, Florida would not have been lost by a few votes in a Supreme Court decision. Had a Gore <laughs> Had a Gore ticket, Graham ticket been elected, the country probably would have avoided what was perhaps the most serious foreign policy era in recent history. George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq. The basis for going to war with Iraq was that Iraq had, that is, that had Iraq, Iraq had developed weapons of mass destruction. Bob never believed the intelligence the administration offered in support of their position. Until this invasion, Iraq was a counterbalance to Iran. Once Iraq was militarily dis demolished, Iran had a free hand to become the biggest instigator of serious trouble in the Middle East. There never was anything quirky about Bob Graham. <laughs> Bob was the only senator to get both war resolutions right. Yes to George Herbert Walker's Bush's resolution and no to George W. Bush's resolution. In the summer of 1990, Iraq invaded and conquered Kuwait. George Herbert Walker Bush did a terrific job of mobilizing Middle East allies, then asking Congress for approval to go to war. Sam Nunn, an expert in these matters and a person Bob had great respect for and confidence in, opposed the war. They met several times with Nunn trying to con convince Bob to oppose the operation. Bob, after most consideration, decided to support Desert Storm. The operation was successful and Allied forces drove the Iraqi army back to Iraq's border. In 2002, George W. Bush asked Congress again to go to war with Iraq because they said Iraq had developed weapons of mass destruction. Bob, an expert in intelligence matters, was far from convinced that Iraq was hiding weapons of mass destruction and voted against the war resolution. 
Bob Graham was the only senator that voted on both resolutions correctly. Yes in 1991 and no in 2002. And by the way, no weapons of mass destruction were found. When Lawton Childs decided not to seek a re-election to the Senate in 1987, a heated election occurred between Connie Mack and a dear friend of Bob's, Buddy McKay. It was a very close election and in order to help Buddy, several weeks before voting, Bob in a press conference called Connie Mack an ideological wacko. Now, I'm not sure whether it should have been ideological or ideological, but in fact, this, uh, it, uh, it, it, this great press was given to this, both in the newspapers and in local television. Connie won and became Florida's junior senator. Senate tradition encourages the senior senator to escort the newly elected senator the dais for, swearing, for the swearing-in ceremony. The day before the swearing-in ceremony, Bob and I are in his office trying to figure out our next step. Bob asked his personal assistant to call Senator Mack's office and see if the senator had time to meet with us. She did, and he did. We went to Mack's office thinking it was going to be a most unpleasant experience. We were totally wrong. Connie Mack was totally gracious and asked Bob to present him at the swearing in. From that meeting, the state of Florida benefited from a bipartisan relationship that lasted all of Senator Mack's 12 year tenure. The senators would meet monthly knowing exactly what they could ask of each other. When constituents visited Washington, members of both staffs would meet with the constituents together. The senators would decide and jointly support those appropriations they felt appropriate to benefit the state of Florida. Friendships developed between the staffs and every six weeks or so on a Friday afternoon, the staffs would gather for a beer social. This type of a bipartisan relationship would be unheard of today. When Bob left the governor's office, the state of Florida was in terrific shape. Rationale was brought to growth management, teachers' pay was competitive, the environment was heading in the right direction, and with Charlie Reed as chancellor, the state university was doing well. I retired in 1998, but in 2001 I returned to Washington as Bob was to assume the chairmanship of the Intelligence Committee and he wanted to reorganize his office. The Florida legislature in 2001 disbanded the Board of Regents, the statutorily created governing board for higher education. Additionally, they authorized and appropriated a medical school for Florida State University in Tallahassee and a law school for Florida A&M located in Orlando. The year prior, the Board of Regents, after a study recommended against creating a medical school at Florida State University. Bob was furious. And after we had a conference call with Robin Gibson, who we generally called on when we were looking for a third person's uh, input, it was decided that we would pass a constitutional amendment creating governance for Florida's higher education system. States with successful higher education systems have con constitutionally created government. Obvious problem was we had no idea how to pass a constitutional amendment. Robin said he had a client, Doc Dockery, who was responsible for passing the high speed uh, rail amendment, constitutional amendment. Doc's advice was to hire a particular outfit that specialized in getting the signatures necessary to qualify for the ballot and to hire David Hill to do the polling. Hill, an academic and polling practitioner who only worked for Republicans, accepted our engagement because he believed in the project. Hill helped us write the ballot description, did two focus groups and one poll, after which he said we would pass the amendment by slightly more than 60%. He was dead on. 
His governor and center of staff with good reason worshiped Bob Graham. He treated his staff with kindness, patience, and understanding. He demanded the best from staff and all made maximum effort to comply. He had a wonderful sense of humor and all enjoyed laughing with him. He was always upbeat, but he was significantly di disappointed when daughter Gwen lost her gubernatorial primary election. When Bob ran in the Democratic primary in 1977, if there were more than two candidates and no candidate reached 50% of the vote, a runoff was held between the two top vote getters. Bob ran second to Bob Chevin in the 1977 primary, but prevailed in the runoff. Gwen ran a close second in a crowded primary, and, and, and I am confident she would have won a runoff. Democrat <laughs> Democratic candidate in the general election lost a close race to the current governor. Gwen would have been a much stronger general, general election candidate and she might well have been governor today. Bob earned the wonderful national and local media coverage that detailed his many accomplishments. I miss my friend. So let me end where I began. I am grateful to the Graham family for allowing me to share some thoughts with you about a friend I loved, Bob Graham. Thank you, buddy. At this time, as we're winding down the service, I'd like to offer these words of hope. Friends, when we die, we do not die into a void. We die into the all-embracing love of God. Again, both our life and our death belong to God. Certainly the life breath of Christianity is love. And personally, I believe that when we die, our spirit is united with those who have loved us most and whom we have loved most. Again, in Christianity, it's always all about the love. Our faith is also about a powerful hope. It's the hope of what God has done for us in and through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. As Paul reminds us in Romans 8, who then can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble do it, or hardship, or persecution, or poverty, or danger, or death? No, in all these things we have complete victory through him who has loved us. For I'm certain that nothing can separate us from his love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor other heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world above nor the world below. There is nothing in all creation that can ever separate us from the love of God, which is through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Friends, let's stand and sing God Bless America.
It's time now for the reading from Psalm 23. Words I'm sure you're all familiar with. Where we read that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's time now for the words of benediction, Dr. Medina. Now, Lord, you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. Our own eyes have seen his salvation, for which you prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and to the glory of your people, Israel. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and mind in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with all of you in your household and our country now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen. go in peace.